from you at the cross. Let the words that I speak this morning be your words. Holy Spirit, penetrate us. Open our ears and our understanding to hear what you're saying to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so gospel methods, gospel methods, everyday gospel rhythms. So today we're going to kind of look at what does that mean to us? How do we apply that? What are you talking about rhythms and methods and all those kind of things? So that's what we're going to examine today, and I promise to try and get through as quickly as possible. How's that? All right, so let's first turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. All right. Everybody there? First Peter chapter 2. Looks like this in my Bible. All right. If you have one that breaks it into, uh, into sections, as some of our translations do, mine says, living godly lives in a pagan society. Okay, so we all found First Peter chapter 2. We're going to be looking at 11 through 12. And it says this. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Amen? Live such lives before them and among them that even though they want to accuse you of doing wrong, they're going to see what you're doing. And they're going to be able to glorify God, right? So let's examine the church. Not the church, little c, but the church, capital C, us, the body of Christ. Let's examine what that looks like. And the first thing that I've got down here, this quote, I want to read out to you so you can fill in those blanks. It says, church is not an event. It's a community. Mission is not an event. It's a lifestyle. We are called to live ordinary life with gospel intentionality. <coughs> That's by Tim Chester. So when we look at the church, what are we? Where was the last sentence? Sure, one more time. I'm sorry. Church is not an event, it's a community. Mission is not an event, it's a lifestyle. We are called to live ordinary life with gospel intentionality. And I didn't break those little lines up for each individual word, but that's what it says. We are called to live ordinary life, the everyday things that we do, with gospel intentionality. Okay? So when we look at the church, us, the body of Christ. One more time, Linda. You got it? Okay. <laughs> the, what, when we want to look at the church and examine, you can hear a debate going on once in a while, going back and forth, that talks about attractional versus a missional church. As if those things are, are exclusive of one another. It's like it has to be this or it has to be that. But really, that's not what our Father God intended. All right? It isn't about whether we are against or for attraction, but the issue really is about where the emphasis lies, the source and the means of salvation. So what are we attracting people with? 
What are we attracting people with and what are we attracting people for would be a question that you could ask yourself, that we as the church should ask ourselves. And that next question that would follow would be who or what are we attracting people with and what are we attracting people to? Is the gospel attraction we are displaying for people, the world, because our verse in 1 Peter tells us that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. So if the attraction that we are displaying for the people, the world around us, what is it about? Is it about an event? Or is it about gospel people, us? What are we displaying? You know, think about church life and church events that you've seen. If it's based on an event only, Christmas program, we're going to have the Christmas cantata, we're going to have the Easter cantata, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that to attract people in. How about we have a great big um, Christian concert, right? Huge bands, lots of lights, and all those kind of things. Why are we attracting people? Are we attracting them to church for the event? Or is our intention for them, are we attracting them with gospel people, with our lives, our individual lives? Is that what we're attracting them with? And what is the purpose? Okay, so we can attract them. All right, we get our finger on and we say, okay, I know that it's not an event-driven thing anymore, right? I know that I'm supposed to attract them by the life that I lived before them because that's what scripture tells me. But what happens next? What's the next step? Are we attracting them for what purpose? Why are we drawing them to, to church? To remain <coughs> here within these four walls? Is this what the reason is to just celebrate church here? Or are we drawing them to train them and equip them so then they can go out and do what Christ told us to do, right? Amen. Amen? That's what the reason for church is, right? Jesus, when he left, he told the disciples what? Go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them everything that I have taught you to observe. That's what he said in Matthew 28. But I think we've got it backwards sometimes. And I can raise my hand and say, me too. All right? Let's just get them into church. Let's just bring them in. What can we do next to bring them in? But that's not the whole purpose. This is where we meet the church, us. We are supposed to go out and tell everyone else about Jesus and the good news, what he's done for us. That's the reason why we draw them. Not to remain here in our four walls, you know, in our pretty little chairs and enjoy the light show and the music and all those kind of things. But we draw them here so that we can be equipped and that we can be prepared and that we then can go out as ambassadors for Christ. Okay? So, if we look at Scripture, the people of God have always been called to display you can write these two words down, right? We have been called to be a display people for God's glory, first statement, and a sent people to the nations. Think about the children of Israel. They were set apart to be different. They did different things. They ate different food. They followed, they prayed differently. Everything that they did was differently, but it wasn't just to be different for the sake of being different. It was so that all the people around them could see the difference. God laid out, if you think about an Old Testament example, Father told the, the children of Israel to leave the corners of the field, the grain fields. Why? So foreigners, when they harvested, he left those open so that foreigners and people who did not know who he was, that if they were walking through, they could glean the grain and be fed. 
That was his purpose. So that they could see the goodness of who God was. Right? New t another Old Testament one um, is that they were supposed to have a room open. Think about when um, the uh, angels came, right? To see Abraham's lot, right? And he were in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And he had to have a room. He went out and saw those foreigners, those journeyers, those travelers that said, come into my house. The children of Israel were supposed to have an extra room in the house so that any foreigners would be able to come in and stay. Why? To see the goodness of God. Not because they were good, hospitable people, which that was what the purpose was too, but that ultimately they would know God and how good God is and how he provides for them and for us. If you want to look at a New Testament example, Jesus said, by your love, they will know that you are my disciples, my students, my followers, right? By the love that you display one to another, by the way you take care of each other, they, the people outside the house of God, will know that you're one of my followers. And that will cause them to question. Right? Didn't Paul say, be ready to give an answer for why you do what you do? He sure did. Well, obviously, if they're asking why, you know, if you have to give an answer, you must be doing something different for them to see. Right? Something different that you must see. Let's turn to Isaiah chap chapter 61. Now, I needed to bring this out because as I was preparing, I'm going to tell you that the Holy Spirit kept this idea of display in my head, right? He kept playing that over, and I kept thinking of oaths of righteousness. So finally, I listened, and I pulled up Isaiah. I kept saying, that's not in my notes. It's not in this stuff. Okay, God, all right. 61, Isaiah 61. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3. Isaiah, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. Now, some of us may recognize this verse as the verse that when Jesus went into the temple and it was his turn to read, he opened the scrolls, and this is what he read. Okay? But there's more significance. So Isaiah, chapter 61. Has everybody found it? Okay. 1 through 3 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty, instead of ashes, the oil of joy, instead of mourning, and a garment of praise. Instead of a spirit of despair, they will be called oaks of righteousness. Hallelujah. And these last things, a planting of the Lord for what? For the display of his splendor. That's us. Oaks of righteousness that are planted. Because Jesus came, right? And he did all these things to set the captive free, to break the chains that the enemy had us bound with, right? He came to set us free so that the very tail end, right, they will be called oaks of righteousness. And righteousness, we're going to say it over and over again, righteousness means right relationship with God. Oaks of righteousness, trees planted in a right relationship with God. 
to display his splendor. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding me to pull this one up. So we, the people of God, have been called to live our lives as a display. You might even say trophies. How many times, I don't know, when we walked, when I was in high school, you walked in and they had that great big trophy case, right? With all the trophies of all the different things that they, the football team or basketball team, whatever tournaments they had won, and they won the trophy. And it was proudly displayed to show that we did it. This is far more grander than those trophies. You know, if you're a bowler and you've won a trophy or something like that, if you come to my house, you're going to see a trophy sitting on, on the bookcase because I won the Castrova Cook-Off in 2014. Okay? So that's proudly displayed, and my name will go on there that I won it. But you see, this is so much more. This is so much more that we get to display the glory of God and what he has done for us. Amen? How amazing is that, that we have the opportunity? So church is not an event. It's a community, right? Mission is not an event. Let's go on a missionary trip too, right? It's not an event. It's a lifestyle. It's something that we do, okay? We are called to live our ordinary, everyday lives out in front of people with gospel with the good news, that's what gospel means, good news intentions. Everything that we do. That's, we've got to change our thinker. I've got to change my thinker. I'm in the process of examining everything that I think about and everything that I do and put it into gospel, good news. Put everything that I do into an intention on purpose. So the activities, now let me put this out here. This is where my mind is changing, trying to change my thinking and what I've been trained. The forms and activities that the church equips for and leads her people to. So all of the activities that we, the church, equip you and I for, and we lead our people to, all of us, must, must be the stuff of everyday life. And if it's not... This is what happens, and this is, I think, where we find ourselves. The church will merely be events and programs we attend. As we fit them into our schedule, well, can I make it on Wednesday night? Can I get there Sunday morning? Church becomes an event that we fit into our schedule and around the rest of our lives. What does that do? Think about it. Church is only Sunday morning, two hours, that's it. The rest of my life I want to do it, right? Sunday I live like a saint, and the rest of the life, the rest of the week, I live like a sinner. That's right? That's what if we if we segregate, decentralize, desacred, right, our life, our total being, everything that we are, all of a sudden then church becomes just an event becomes a place to go on Sunday morning. You might as well say it becomes a club that you join, right? A social event that you go to. It doesn't mean that it changes me. It doesn't mean that it changes my life. There's no intentionality about how I live, right? That's getting awfully quiet in here. And then church becomes a ticket to heaven. It becomes a life pack. It becomes something that you put on. This is my life preserver. I can do whatever I want, live however I want to live. But see, I've got this thing, this church that I attend, this building, this event that I'm a part of, this club that I belong to. It just becomes that, a life pack. Something that... Um, Something that's going to get me out of hell. And that's not what church is all about. That's not what she's all about. The church, the bride of Christ. So every believer, now I'm going to put this in your thinker. 
because this is not how we think. Every believer is called to be a full-time paid minister. Let me say that again. Every believer is called to full-time paid ministry. God just chooses how he's going to move our paychecks from somewhere to us. We are all called to be in full-time ministry. And we're all paid. Whether you're the pastor of a church, whether you're a window, uh, a supervisor at a window washer uh, you know, company, or whether you check out cables someplace to make sure that they're okay, we're all paid to be in full-time ministry. All of us. That changes how you look at things. Now it's not just the pastor and his wife who are responsible for winning the sheep and bringing them back to God. That's not, that's not just our responsibility. And if you look at things naturally, sheep beget sheep. The shepherd doesn't beget sheep. We are all sheep of the great shepherd. We're supposed to beget other sheep. Our life is meant to be lived out in front of the pagans so that they may see what we do and how we act and glorify God by what he does for us. That's what we're supposed to do. So, we're at our notes. The normative life, the normal life, every day. We talk, what, the title of this is talking about everyday gospel rhythms. So what does that mean? What is an everyday rhythm? That word tripped me up. I had to think about that. What is the rhythm, the rhythm of life? You hear about that in the world, and that's like what? You know, how you eat, when you sleep, when you play, all those kind of things. But how does that apply to our life? So, the normative life. Let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, 23-33. And, Labish, can you read that one for us? Okay, and then Richard, if you don't mind reading, could you catch Colossians chapter 3? And we're just, we're just going to actually specifically focus on a couple verses in that. We're not going to, but I want us to read that whole entirety, okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Have we made it? Almost. All things are in this are misunderstood, and they are written. But not all things are helpful, expedient, profitable, and wholesome. All things are legitimate, but not all things are constructive in character and edifying to spiritual life. Let no one then seek his own good and advantage and profit, but rather each one of the other let him seek the welfare of his neighbor. As the meat offered to idols, eat anything that is sold in the meat market without raising any question or investigating on the grounds of conscientious scruples. For well, the whole earth is the Lord's, and everything has to be in In case one of the unbelievers invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is served to you without examining it into its source because of conscientious scruples. But if someone tells you, this has been offered in sacrifice to an idol, do not eat it, out of consideration for the person who informed you and for conscience sake, I mean for the sake of his conscience, not yours, do not eat it. For why should another man's scruples apply to me and my liberty of action be determined by his conscience? If I partake of my food with thankfulness, why am I accused that spoke evil because of that for which I give thanks? So then, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you may do, do all for the honor and glory of God. Do not let yourselves be hindrances by giving, and offense to the truth or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Do not lead others into sin by your mode of life. Just as I myself strive to please, to accommodate myself to the opinions, desires, and interests of others, adapting myself to all men in everything I do, not aiming at or considering my own profit and advantage, but that of the many in order that they may be saved. Amen. Read verse 31 one more time for me. So then, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you may do, do all for the honor and glory of God. Do it all 
all for the young and the glory of God. Richard? Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, see the things that are above, for Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hid in Christ in God. When Christ who is, is your life, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual uh, immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and covetousness uh, with idolatry. Uh, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, and slander, I've seen talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self in its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Hebrew. Uh, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or see. Skyping. Slave. Free, but Christ is all in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, willing, deeds, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, put the put Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, the Lord. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through Him. So, what did we see in those two passages? Those were all things that could be visibly seen by other people, right? Our actions, our actions. So to, if you look at what we've said before, I'm going to bring this back up here. So in our gospel life, we want to talk about the fact that who God is. Who is he? What has he done, right? What he did. What did he do for us? Because of who God is and because of what he did, who does that make me? Who am I? Right? But then, because I am in him, and I am saved, sanctified, set apart, that changes what I do. That's what we saw in these verses, right? It Because of who we are, we are encouraged to be different. It changes what we do and how we do it. Amen? Mm -hmm. It changes who we are because of what... He did for us because of who God is. So to walk in line with the gospel means that the truth of the gospel gets worked out in the stuff of our lives. When we eat, what we eat, how we do things, how do we live our lives out before the people that we're in contact with. Now, if you put that in context, that means if we're living that out and we only live it in front of everybody here, well, we're going to glorify God because that's what we do. But nobody outside these four walls is going to see how good God is. Right? They're not going to experience His goodness, His mercy, and all that He is. They're not going to see all of those things unless we go and take this outside our walls. 
And these verses talked about that. It showed us the actual everyday stuff that we did, that we do. So every part of life is supposed to be dedicated to the ministry and the mission of the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to everything, to everyone. Teaching them what I've told you. To obey what I've told you. So, let's look at our uh, verses here. Look at that, that, that quote one more time that I put on there. Church is not an event. It's a community. Mission is not an event. It's a lifestyle. And we are called to live ordinary life with gospel intentionality. So if we compartmentalize, we've talked about, we kind of, I hit on that just a little bit. If we compartmentalize, there you go. I said it once and then I couldn't get my, you see, past my eye teeth, right? So if you put things into compartments and you, you, you'd say, well, church is here and this is what I do on church and this is what I do here and this is what I do there, then we're not living our life out in front of anybody else, right? That's not what we're doing. We need to see our life as a total ministry. And that's the part that we have to change in our thinker. Because we've been taught that church is the thing that we're supposed to do. You have to be in church on Sunday which is a good thing, but why are we going to church, right? To be equipped. It's, it's changing the purpose behind everything that we're doing. So we need to see our life as ministry and mission. That's what our life is about. The Lord sent us out. In, second, in First Peter, we read it, right? That the pagans may see your life and the deeds, the good deeds that you're doing, and glorify God. That's the whole purpose of it. So, there are some transferable patterns, and that's where I understood what it meant for a rhythm. There are patterns or rhythms that are shown in God's Word and that are in our everyday lives. And so that's how we turn our life into ministry and living it out before other people. So if we look at the story of God, right, and we said that the story of God, because there were two, uh, God, there were two ways of looking at the gospel, right? The story of God is creation, then the fall. What did He do about that? Then he brought redemption and restoration. So everything throughout. The entire Word of God talks about creation, us, what's going on in life, the fall that happens, how He redeems us, each situation even, okay, because it's not just the redemption of the cross, but redeems us in our everyday mess ups, you know, and what we do and how we do things. So, how He redeems us and the restoration. Remember we talked about that I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. There's a constant thing that goes on with that. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the story of God, every culture, every people, in every part of the world has a rhythm of life. Through each of these rhythms, we have the opportunity to walk by faith. This is where we're going to bring a couple more scriptures in. So we have the opportunity to walk by faith. So walking in line with the truth of the gospel, or we can choose to walk in fear and prideful rebellion to God, or walking in unbelief. So if you look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, and that's just a couple books over from where we're at right now. Right, you just got to go back to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 14. The story here is Paul goes to see Peter, or Cephas, right? Or Cephas came to Antioch and, and uh, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. 
in verse 12. For before certain men came from John, or from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, when Peter arrived to come see them, he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Okay? So he lived his life one way with the Gentiles, and then he, because somebody else came that had a different belief, he became afraid. He didn't live out the truth of the gospel. Whatever I do, whatever I write, that's all unto the glory of God, right? So let's go down to verse 14. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Because he wasn't living his life the way that he knew with gospel intentionality, right? He knew that it didn't matter what I ate as long as I gave thanks to God. But because somebody came along, Cephas, who was a Jew, came along, all of a sudden, he became afraid. James did. And started living more like a Jew instead. But then Paul, who was in his presence all the time and knew how he really lived and what he really ate and, and how he, he acted in, in the gospel context, called him out on it. We need to think about how we're living our lives in line with the truth of the gospel. Are we living our lives the way the gospel says, or are we living it out afraid? Afraid in unbelief. It's important. Take a look at your life as total ministry, right? And live your life in line with the gospel. What the Lord is teaching you, what the Holy Spirit is leading you to and, and, and guiding you into. Live your life in tune, in truth, to what the gospel is telling you, the good news that you know. So, what is the truth of the gospel? We're going to look at Romans chapter 1. Glenda, do you mind reading Romans chapter 1, verse 17? And Jason, would you read Galatians chapter 3, verse 11? And Ramey, would you read Galatians chapter 2, verse 20? Yes, ma'am. So what did each one of these verses talk about? It's not because of the works that we do, right? So it's not anything that we can do for ourselves. The truth of the gospel is, is that Christ did it for us, right? The just shall live by faith, 
righteousness, all of those things are done not because of I'm good or because I've done certain things or because I've observed the law. Because the law in itself is going to condemn you if you just serve that. There's, there's no way that the law can redeem you. It was only set out. The law was given to be a teacher so that we knew we would learn what sin is and be able to recognize it. That's why the law is there. But Christ came to set us free, to pay the price, right? So no longer is it I who lives, but Christ that lives in me because of the righteousness, the right relationship that he's provided for us. So if we come to understand, now here's the piece, if we come to, come to understand what the gospel means in our lives, okay, what does it really mean? Then we can live that out in front of the world. We can give an answer for why we live the way we live. What is our hope in? Our hope is not in the financial world. Our hope is not in the government. Our hope is not in any of those things, but our hope, everything that we have is supplied by God. Every single thing. And we can see that over and over and over again in the story of God. If you look at the children of Israel, when they were out in the wilderness, what did God do? He provided every single thing that they needed. He provided water when they needed water. He provided food when they needed food. He gave them meat when they wanted meat. He provided every single thing. Their clothes did not wear out. And think about that. Those children that walked out of there with them, if they were like one year old, what did they do? Did their clothes grow on them? Like, you know, did it, did it expand? How did they do that? Nothing wore out. They had everything that they needed. When God said, when Moses asked him, well, who should I say that, that sent me? I am. I am everything that you need. There's nothing else. I am everything that you need. Okay? So we need to live our lives by faith in God. In the Son of God who loved us and gave up his life for us in every part of life. Live by faith. Okay. It's 11.37. Pastor says 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, so. We will. Yep, we can we go. So let's just start with the story. And you can look at some of these verses throughout the week. So the story formed. So what does that mean to have a story formed? We know and submit our lives to the story of God while also becoming familiar with each other's stories. This is part of the rhythm, the everyday rhythms that we have. All of us, and I was thinking about this. I'm probably not going to be able to see you. All of us have a story, right? Our lives are lived out based on who we are, what is what makes us up, our family, our culture, perhaps our schooling. But we're not by ourselves because, see, we live our lives inside of our families. If you were to look at the Castrova family, Bob and Tina and their kids live with inside the Castrova family, which is even bigger. It's even bigger than that. See, us here in Madison, the Castrova family lives in Madison. So our story is affected by the community that we live in, how we might live perhaps, the things that we do. But then, not only does that happen, it can be about the community, it can be about our job, it can be about where we go to school, right? Then we live our lives within the state of Wisconsin. Our story continues to be formed. But all in all, where does all of that fit? 
God's story. We live our lives out within God's story. If you think about an apple, right? What do you see when you get your apple? Do you see just the apple? The apple's not all of it itself, just a piece of fruit. If you were to take a, a slice out of it, you would see the core. And inside that core is what? Seeds. But do you see just a seed? What's in that? There's a tree. And on that tree, there might be, that tree might become an orchard. Right? All sorts of things. So an apple is just not an apple. There's, there's a tree, there's an orchard, there's, there's all sorts of things within that fruit, the same with our lives. Our life is just not of its own. Our lives is more than just that. We're a part of a bigger picture, a bigger story. God's plan and purpose to go out into the world and live the gospel out. So, Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Way in the beginning of the Old Testament, fifth book of the Bible. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verses 6 through 9. Okay? There, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 4. But. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. Verse 6. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So everything that the Lord God did for his, cho his chosen children he said that this, this law is just not supposed to be here. It's supposed to be lived out in life. Every part of what they did. And we too, because we, when we accept Jesus, right, when Jesus becomes our Savior, when we say, yes, we're going to follow you, when we are adopted into the family, we're adopted into the children of God. And that's what he's speaking to right there to live everything, all that he teaches us, out before everyone, our children, our neighbors, everyone. My story and our stories. So when we're living out our life in front of our family, our community. There is a, a, a neat little example that I've got here. Part of our story is that when we're listening to what's being said in our story, we need to measure that up against God's word, against his gospel. How am I living my life? Am I living my life according to the truth of the gospel? Or am I living my life according to the world, what the world says, what the world tells me to do. And the same when we're in our communities and we're talking to one another, how are, how, how are they living? Am I picking up on something? Here's an example. Hot off the press in the Kostrovo living room. I got to do it to him and he got to do it to me. <laughs> so we, there, was, there was things that were going on in his life that he was experiencing that was not... He was anxious, right? He was kind of upset and, and a little frustrated. And the same for me. I, there was something that went on, and I was feeling really sad. 
and there was no joy in my life. And so what you do is if you have the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is in your life, what are the gifts of the Spirit? Love, Love joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, all those kind of things, right? But we weren't experiencing that. The things in our life was like those apples, right? Or fruit in our life, right? But it wasn't necessarily the fruit of the Spirit. It was something it, it wasn't associated with. And so um, Bob said to me, you know, like, is it anger or fear? Um, Self-doubt. Yeah, that's good. Right? So we went down there, and so you have to ask yourself these questions. Right? My life is not reflecting the gospel at this point. Why am I angry? What are you believing is happening? Why am I doubting? Why is there fear in my life? Is it because I'm not believing God is in control? Is God not able to save me? Has God abandoned me? Why am I feeling all of these things? Who is in charge? Is God not omnipotent? Is he not, um, is he not able? Doesn't he have all strength? Isn't he able to save me? or save the situation? Well, of course, when you think about it, okay, these things that I'm experiencing are not according to the gospel, but they're according to the enemy that came from the world. And so then you go through the process, well, then who is God? Who is God? So you can go all the way back over here as who is God? He's all powerful.
in front of the world, they're going to see something different. And they're going to ask, and we're going to be able to give an answer, how good God is. The rest of the sermon will be taught next week, okay? Because there's much, much more of this. But it's our gospel identity, who we are, so we can live our lives out of the kingdom of God. It's not easy because the world and your flesh and everything in us pulls us to doing our own thing. But our identity is the fruit of the Spirit now, not all this frustrations in the world. Amen. And that's what the world will see. Our love for one another will change us. So I've been doing Christianity since I was 19 years old. And I did a lot of stuff. But now going forward, what's going to change is that we will do it together to glorify God. Amen. And we'll be a family, and that will be demonstrated to the world around us. It's different. It's a lot that we're not doing. We're not trying to build a church here and get a lot of numbers and all that kind of stuff. But that's part of uh, what will happen. Um, so I'm not worried about that. But when we change, it will reflect Christ, and that will uh, uh, we'll see uh, more people come to the kingdom of God. And then we're going to say, don't come to our church. Don't come to just this event. I want you to come to this community of believers so you can do the same thing. So in my heart, I see out here, I see, uh, I see a, a church planter and a church planter and a church planter and a church planter and a church planter. Amen. Being, being, uh, uh, seeing us uh, live the gospel out. The world around us. Today we're going to end with uh, communion, and I want since we're really small, so I want the beach. And I want all you guys on this side to get us together. The beach, come up and grab one of those plates. And I just want to get a circle right here. I want you guys to get a angel. Would you make a little circle right here? And I just want to demonstrate to you communion in a way uh, uh, community, uh, <laughs> gospel community should do it. Instead of me directing it from the pulpit, saying that the pastor has to do all this stuff. We're going to say, you can direct it from where you're sitting. Okay, so we're going to pretend that we're in a living room right here, and Angel's going to create a little circle. So everybody on this side, would you get over here? And in and the beach, would you, and yeah, thank you, Richard, help make a little circle right here. And we're going to do com communion together. And remember, when we take communion, we're just honoring Jesus. And, uh, we're, and then we'll have a moment to pray for each other. So.